Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie. I'm Long Island's eating disorder therapist and I am here with Lauren Sharp. She is a nutritionist and we are both amidst the coronavirus at the time of this recording. So we are social distancing, um, therefore we are doing a Zoom meeting, but we have a lot of really great information to get to. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Lauren to introduce herself. Hello everyone. I'm so excited to be on Stephanie's page. I am, my name is Lauren, as she mentioned, and I am the nutritionist behind, if you're on Instagram, at Low and Lemons. And I'm so excited to chat through some things with Stephanie today and hopefully answer some of your questions. And I'm always available via Instagram DM, email, if you have any questions as well. So feel free to reach out. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'm going to include all that information at the end of this video, um, as well as in my description. So if you want to reach out to Lauren, and if you have any questions, we can always do, if you're open to it, maybe a follow-up or, or something like that. Um, so today we wanted to talk about fear foods. And that's something that I know that, Lauren, you have said that you've worked a lot with. Um, so I'm wondering if you can first introduce us to, well, what is fear foods? Because some people may not know if maybe you're watching as a, a loved one is struggling with an eating disorder or whatnot. So what is a fear food? Um, additionally, what might start, you know, when do you notice a fear food developing? Yeah. So fear foods, um, you may be aware of it. You may not be. Mm -hmm. um, I found that a lot of people that I work with are coming to me for something like, you know, just healing their relationship with food. And, mm -hmm. and it's more of like a binge behavior. And I really ungunk everything with them. And we realize that a lot of the um, binging is due to the restricting and the fear foods that they've created these rules around these foods. So essentially what a fear food is, is that you've created a rule around that food, right? So maybe it's, um, I don't eat carbs past 6 PM, or I don't eat uh, any food that has more than six grams of sugar, or I don't eat added sugar. I don't eat whatever that rule is. That is a fear food. Mm. So Typically, I see people will come to me with foods like carbs um, that they fear or sugar, high sugar foods. Um, those are or high fat foods. Those are typically fear foods. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting. You're saying saying that you seem to realize that there's a correlation between uh, a fear food and the development of food rules. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that people don't realize that food rules play such a large role in their life until they are kind of, um, you know, really up face with it. And once you point it out, point it out to them, out to them, they realize that, Oh, I guess I have been putting more restrictions, restrictions than I noticed. And that can turn into actually fearing the food. So for example, if I, um, come into contact with a client, client that has been on like a low carb diet, mm. then, um, they, at first it's just a rule, right. Where it's like, okay, I'm not going to have any car. I'm not going to have more than 35 net carb grams per day or something. And it's like, oh, it's just my rule. I'm just following the plan. And then eventually if someone asks you to, you know, have a piece of, have a bowl of pasta or something, you're fearing it because you've been following these rules for so long and it becomes this fear. Mm. That's so interesting because I think that what we don't really realize as a culture at, in its entirety is that we have so many food rules that have just developed. Yeah. And I think I was actually on Instagram today and something had said that we just like develop these like odd rules. And at some point in time, there was there's a, you know, this is bad for you. And then all of a sudden it's good for you. And it's just like these random just things and rules that God only knows where they come from. Um, right. But I'd imagine that that is really a lot of people really struggle with that. And in my experience as well, I see that. And then it develops into something more that it's not only just kind of like this guideline for you, but now it's a fear. Right. Yeah. And that's originally why I got into nutrition because I played sports all of my life and, um, I wasn't as active anymore and I realized that nutrition was really important and I was looking things up just trying to learn more about it and I could never find a solid answer for anything mm. and that's still true the answer yeah. is always it depends mm. um but that's why I got into it because I wanted to understand the science behind it and what the real true research was mm. um rather than 
being so fearful of, you know, these blog posts where people are like, you can't eat carbs because it turns straight to fat or mm-hmm. you can't eat too much fat because there's so many calories or mm-hmm. any of those, um, you know, statements that people just make so blindly without mm-hmm. any education on how that macronutrient is even digested in the body. Right, right. And I think that's like so important that I know that if someone starts with me, there's two components or there's actually very many components to someone who's struggling with the eating disorder but if someone stops at me first as a therapist I try so hard to make sure that they're also getting on board with a a nutritionist as well that works with eating disorders um, Mm -hmm. specifically because of course as you probably have already seen that there's you know therapists and nutritionists that are not so good at what they're doing and kind of perpetuate um, this Mm -hmm. type of these fears. Um, and then there's ones that are, are really, really helpful. So I always try to make sure that my clients are also seeing a nutritionist as well that has that type of um, understanding behind all right. that. Uh, so what do you think is the like the importance of having that type of um, nutritionist that I'm assuming very important, but what do you think is about um, having that that's really helpful for someone with, you know, these fear foods? Yeah, I think that it can be um, really important because although, you know, the mindset and therapy aspect of it is so, so important. So is just like education on, you know, debunking these myths that, uh, you probably believe from diet culture and diet culture, just really swamping your mind with all the noise that's going on out there and untrue facts. And so something like, you know, you can't eat carbs because they make you fat. Like that's just complete bogus and is not true. So um, having a nutritionist who can really help you understand how the body works and why you don't need to be fearing these foods. Mm -hmm. Um, I think as a culture, we really over exaggerate things where it's like sugar is the death of you. Coconut oil is the worst oil ever. Like Mm -hmm. these things are so over exaggerated. So I think to see a nutritionist is so important just to debunk some of these things and talk through your concerns in terms of like what is really fearing you, making you fear these types of foods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because I can work through on my end, you know, the thought process and such like that, but I can't also, I can't, back up with the science because I have not studied nutrition obviously in in the same regard that you have or in any formal setting other than you know just through my job and working very closely with nutritionists so that's Mm -hmm. why it's so important to make sure that you have the the nutrition aspect as well now on the topic of fear foods do you see like different levels of fear foods like maybe something that a person will just say like I am not like going to touch that like I'll die before I do that and then then some that Mm -hmm. is a little bit easier to to face yeah I mean there's different levels of fear foods for um different people but then there's also different levels of food fears for the same person right Mm -hmm. so for different people that obviously just goes along the spectrum of how how disordered the eating is so I don't really work with people who are strictly you know with a diagnosed eating disorder. I work with more like disordered eating behaviors. Mm -hmm. So, um, someone who may have food rules around food where it's like, I don't eat past 6 PM, but like, they're still, you know, getting a decent amount of calories in and, um, they, they wouldn't, you know, have a mental breakdown if they were told to eat one of their food, um, Mm -hmm. fear foods. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, someone with an eating disorder, it's a little bit more severe where it would really cause dis stress and anxiety for them to have to consume one of these foods or um, break one of these rules, like not eating after six or whatever it is. Um, So I think there's a whole spectrum. And then within the same person, there's foods that are um, more fearful than others. So typically with disordered eating, I start with um, the foods that are just a little bit more comfortable um, because I find that smaller goals are just better to start with because once they see that they can conquer that, then they have the motivation to keep going. Whereas if we started with their biggest fear food, they're like, Lauren, what are you telling me to do? This is insane. I hate this. This is so uncomfortable. So if we start with one of their lower fear foods, I make them, you know, have a whole list of what they're fearing. And we start with foods that they fear um, a little bit less and start to integrate them and um, really 
make sure that it's a part of not everyday life, but mm. you know, weekly life and it's mm. just incorporated. So it's not like, Oh, I only have ice cream on weekends or whatever the rule may be. Right. Right. And you had mentioned about eating disorders and disordered eating. And I know I talked about this as well. And I see people on both, um, both sides really and mm. the spectrum more so for in my eyes. Um, but when you're talking about it, can you just give a little bit of an overview as to what is the difference, at least from your perspective, um, this way for anyone who might not know that, you know, eat, disordered eating even exists? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, if you're diagnosed with an eating disorder, that is a medical diagnosis. Um, there's many different, you know, types. There's anorexia, there's binge purge type, there's all these different, um, you know, sectors of an eating disorder, whereas disordered eating is, um, it's less consuming. It still consumes your life, but with an eating disorder, your everyday life is, is very much consumed and difficult to go about, Mm -hmm. um, because constantly food and body image is at the forefront of your mind. So disorder eating is, um, it's really just, in my opinion, how much it are your food rules and your body image affecting your overall life? Are you mm-hmm. constantly like having panic attacks because of food and body image? Or are you, you know, you have these rules and it's really frustrating for you, but overall you're doing okay, mm-hmm. you know? So I think it, it really depends on the person and um, it's so individualized. And yeah. my answers are always like, it depends because you just never know. But that's, that's life too. And not yeah. everything is black and white. And that's a really important note that you're making that eating disorders and disordered eating, um, it's not just black and black or white. And one of the things mm-hmm. that I always, because uh, I don't know if I talked to you about this before, but I also do like presentations with schools um, and such mm-hmm. in, in, in the community. And one of the things that I talk about is that a big thing that dif- differentiates something from being being just maybe like a quirk um, or an actual mental health diagnosis is how much does it interrupt your daily life? How much is it making it so that you are not really able to function in the way that a typical person in your age group would be able to function? So I think that's a really important point to make. Um, and you yeah. have also mentioned about like how you might start introducing your foods and I'm all about like baby steps. I always say with my clients that nothing is a failure. We're really working on learning opportunity or we're finding opportunities to really be able to achieve goals, but we don't want to start at a goal that's going to be like, it's not going to happen. And then all of a sudden you lose your momentum or you lose hope or just inspiration. So uh, along those lines, Obviously, for someone struggling with an eating disorder or disordered eating, it is very important for us to be able to reintroduce those fear foods back into the person's life. So can you give a little bit of a background as to one, when you might find that that's an appropriate time to start doing that with whatever that might be um, and how that may look? So when is an appropriate time to start introducing those yeah. fear foods? Mm. Yeah. So again, it depends, right. um, you know, eating disorders, it's, it's, it's very complicated with, mm. you know, weight restoration and all of that, like food fear, food, feared foods initially might not even be a topic. Mm. Whereas in disordered eating, um, most people that come to me, we start working on it right away because I think that's like the main thing that they're coming to me for because they want to have a healthy relationship with food and they want to stop fearing these foods. Mm. So for me, we really start right away. Mm. Um, Excuse me. In terms of how we, so like I said, we make a list of all of the foods that they fear. Um, so maybe at the top of that list, it's bread, and at the bottom, like, like top being easiest to reincorporate, bottom being most difficult. Um, and bottoms like a piece of pizza or like peanut butter or something. Um, so with with toast, I just take it very slow. Where it's like, okay, well, uh, what do you normally have for breakfast? And it's like two eggs and you know cheese and say they're like trying to cut out carbs so they do like a lot of protein and fat Mm -hmm. um then I would say okay well how would it feel if we did a half of a piece of toast um with tomorrow's breakfast uh starting you know with these really small steps or even like I'm not against diet foods Mm -hmm. um I don't think that they should be the only food that you're allowed to eat but if somebody is more comfortable starting there, Mm -hmm. then 
And if they're still going to continue to see me through that so that I can get them to the place where they're eating, you know, normal bread, um, I'm okay with that. If they, if they want to pick a, you know, a high fiber bread, that's more comfortable to them, um, and start with that, that's okay. Um, it might be a little bit more comfortable at first and, and show them, you know, oh, I can actually do this. I made this tiny step and now I'm comfortable with this. And once they're comfortable, my job is to keep pushing them to try, you know, the next step. Mm -hmm. That is so, thank you for sharing that. That's actually the first time that I've even heard that as well, because I also see a lot of nutritionists just trying to, um, not working with, you know, the actual, um, it, it like not working with a person in such such small ways in terms mm -hmm. of you know being able to be okay with perhaps introducing a food that might still be a little disordered um because yeah. that is you know it's really important and that's this is what I also share with my clients that I'm working with you I'm not working against you and ultimately mm -hmm. we want to get you to a certain place but baby steps however that's going to look that's important that we get you to the ultimate place and we don't want to overwhelm you so if diet foods as you're saying is something that's going to be helpful for them to get to that place you're okay with that and that's a very interesting um thing and I appreciate you sharing that so. yeah and I think that a lot of the times um you know in in different types of treatment if you force someone it's like okay today we're having bread and they're like so uncomfortable with it they might be like okay I had a piece of bread and then stop working with me and then they totally go back to the old ways so I would rather them you know, take baby steps and maybe, you know, it's always a step forward. It's not a step backward because they're trying, you know, a diety food. That's mm -hmm. fine. It's a little bit disordered. Yeah. But they're coming from a place that's extremely disordered to less disordered. So mm -hmm. it's like you have to just work in these little baby steps or else mm -hmm. the, the changes are not going to be sustainable for them. And they're just mm -hmm. going to end up right back where they started. Mm -hmm. Which is why, <clears throat> excuse me, that with eating disorders or disordered eating, recovery takes a long time because we yeah. are working with such baby steps. And mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that. And I know a lot of people... I know that I see a lot of my clients get very impatient. They're like, well, I, I don't want to do that, but that's too much for me too. But I also feel like, what the heck am I even doing? And we need to get to a place, you're right, every step forward is a step forward no matter how small. Um, and we don't want to see mm -hmm. a giant leap forward and then start leaping backwards even quicker at a quicker pace. That's not going to be helpful or sustainable. Right. Mm -hmm. And you exactly. know, one of the other things with regards to fear foods and reintroducing that, and this is definitely where I could see that our jobs get a little bit more jumbled together um, because, you know, sometimes I'm dealing with a little bit more of the food piece and sometimes you're dealing with the mindset piece um, just because of what comes mm -hmm. up in, in session. Um, of course, I always divert it back to, you know, make sure that you're talking to your nutritionist about this because this is, you know, obviously important, mm -hmm. but there's a mindset piece to it. So what types of mindset do you see and what do you tend to work with on your end um, with the fear foods that are mm -hmm. coming up for them and introducing that back? Yeah. yeah. So all of my clients get a resources packet and a lot of it you know, has to do with body image as well, not just fear foods. Um, so the first step in my process is mindset and goal setting. So um, we really break down their goals into not only outcomes. Um, so it's like, okay, what outcome do you want to see? Um, I want to see myself. I want to be able to eat bread without guilt. That's the outcome. So it's like, okay, we, we created this outcome. Now that's not going to get us anywhere. What are the behaviors that are going to get us there? So next they set their behavioral goal. Mm -hmm. So, okay, how, what behaviors are going to get you comfortable with eating bread? It's like, okay, every morning I'm going to have a half a piece of toast. And then that's the behavior that they think will get them to that place. And then their smart goals. So I don't know if you use smart goals, smart, um, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. Yes. So very specific goals. Mm -hmm. So um, they then break down the behavioral goal into a very specific goal um, that they could implement this week. So it's like, okay, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I'm going to have a piece of toast with breakfast. Mm -hmm. um, and then for the next week or something. And then after that, it'll be, they'll reevaluate, see how it when did it you know not go successfully at all and then we reevaluate and say okay 
what can we do better next time? Why didn't this work? Was it too uncomfortable? Was it too much too soon? What was the issue? Um, so I think goal setting is really important to kind of keep them motivated and make sure that those goals aren't too overwhelming because that's what we realize when we reevaluate them. It's like, well, why would, why didn't this work? It's like, well, that was just really, really scary for me. And I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. let's take a step back then. So I think that's really important for mindset. And then the other part that I do is a diet culture detox. So completely detoxing from diet culture. Um, I have a whole worksheet on it, but essentially it's going through your Instagram or what most of my people are on Instagram. It depends where else you're getting this, you know, diet culture from. You might have diet books in your house, like getting rid of those, but going through your Instagram and really diversifying your feed because we are so, it is so ingrained in us to be looking at models that are really, really thin and, you know, all bodies are great bodies, whether they're thin or larger, but it for some people can create these disordered thoughts when their entire feed is with, you know, is consumed with thin bodies Mm -hmm. because that's all they can believe that is worthy and, um, you know, capable. So diversifying your feed, which honestly has gotten so much easier because so many more people are putting their bodies out there, which is amazing. Um, and just realizing that, like, I think there's a hashtag called like hashtag, um, normalize normal bodies, which I love because it's like people that are just like standing, not like posing and what a normal body just looks like without being, you know, Kendall Jenner or something. I was, I was watching a TikTok video today about, um, this girl like picking she was like oh Kendall Jenner has no fat on her stomach and then she like showed her stomach and she was like this is what a normal body looks like like um you know so I think diversifying your feed really helps with the mindset and um what else do I do and then I and then I have another worksheet where we really get down to like the nitty-gritty of what's holding them back um so I can't remember the exact questions I have on there, but basically they got a worksheet. It's like the mindset worksheet. And, um, I ask them what they value. What do you value in your life? Um, what, what is holding you back in your life? Like, like how much of your headspace will be freed up? Like, what will your life look like? Um, after we stop working together, what is your ideal life and what do we have to get through to get you there? Mm -hmm. Um, so I think helping them paint that, like, perfect, not perfect life, but ideal life for themselves really gives them the motivation, um, the intrinsic motivation to realize that this isn't for anyone else. This is for me. Mm. Um, and I think that's like one of the biggest pieces Mm. and to do it in the beginning with goal setting and mindset and detoxing from diet culture, is just like really setting the foundation and setting them up for success. Mm -hmm. So I'm like tripping out a little bit here because we have such similar um, things that we work with. I mean, one actually with regards to the smart goals and the uh, the social media detox, uh, which is what I, I've been calling it. I actually have videos on each of them and I'll li- definitely li- leave them in the links um, or the cards up at- up on top. But that is so interesting when you're talking about that diversifying the, the media feed. I see mm-hmm. that there's just social media is just so, so um, can be so detrimental detrimental and really cause really bad cases of comparisonitis. And I love that you're talking about not only I I talk more about like detoxing from anything that if you reflect and afterwards, you're like, okay, that doesn't make me feel good. And actually, I'm kind of noticing that everything on this page never makes me feel good. So detoxing from it. But I love the addition of diversifying it and finding things of people um, and pages that are normalizing normal bodies. Because it's so true that also, um, there's just a very small range of what you see typically on social media and what we're, we're tending to follow, but that is definitely changing, um, which is amazing. So I yeah. love all of that, that you're talking about. Um, and then also you had mentioned we're going back to like the fear foods. I wanted to ask one more question on that with going to, um, so the challenging yourself. Um, Mm -hmm. so one of the things that I see with my clients is that when we, when the nutritionist starts to challenge them with the fear food, that if they go a while, they might do it and then they go a while without having it. And then I've Mm -hmm. started to to see a spike again in that fear food. And then it's just going back to square one. So what do you say on that and how do you work against that happening? Yeah. 
So that's definitely um, very important. So it's the same thing with like exposure therapy in, you know, anxiety, um, where it's like, okay, they're fearing, you know, social situations. Mm -hmm. So if they go out to a social situation where it's like five people and they're like, oh, that was okay. And then they go to 10 people and they're like, oh, that was fine. And, you know, they grow to be able to be at an event with 50 people. That's great. But then they are a homebody for the next month. Then it like becomes scary again because they're like, hmm, I don't don't know. But what I say is it's really important to remember and like relive that moment that you had been comfortable with that food and maybe they didn't get to full comfort but um but reliving that moment it's like oh well two weeks ago I was eating it and I was completely fine Mm -hmm. and and nothing bad happened and I really enjoyed it so reliving that moment I think is really important um and continuing to incorporate those foods so again just depends on the spectrum of eating disorder versus disordered but um you know, somebody who is more on the side of disordered eating, it might be a little bit easier for them to, um, they might have less fear food. So it's easier to incorporate them into everyday life. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think reliving the moment and recognizing what did, what does their life look like without this food and what does their life look like with this food? So if they are going to continue with this food rule where they're taking a step back when they had just conquered it, mm-hmm. do you want to go through that again? Or do you want to, you know, incorporate it every other day or every three days just so that you are, um, you know, staying on track and making sure that you don't have to experience that fear again. So I think, um, it comes back to mindset, right? Where it's like, okay, um, we have to make sure that this is your end goal and you're not going to get there. You're going to take steps back and it's going to be more uncomfortable than if you just keep pushing through Mm -hmm. and, um, reminding them of that. Okay. One of the things that you had mentioned at the beginning was reliving that moment. And one of the things Mm -hmm. that I often recommend to my clients, particularly those who experience anxiety, such as in the example of what you're saying with social anxiety, Mm -hmm. um, usually we fear like the worst and like, Oh my gosh, if I go out to a party, I'm definitely, everyone's going to stare at, me everyone's gonna think I'm weird everyone's thinking about me um, mm-hmm. I'm gonna trip I'm gonna fall I'm gonna look like dumb and stupid and all these horrible thoughts that are very very unlikely to happen um, so one of the things that I recommend to my clients is to I'm a huge fan of journaling so I suggest writing down your fear ahead of time and then mm-hmm. always afterwards you did not have I mean like it's Im- almost impossible to live up to that fear um, and then right. I ask them as soon as you can after the moment when you get home or as close to the event as possible try to jot down what actually happened and continuing that type of um, exercise so that the next time that you are faced with that you can recall and this is your own account it's not someone else it's not a recovery book it's your own account that what you actually feared did not happen and in fact a lot of times it could be actually wonderful so do you think that that could be helpful in that what you're saying with reliving the moment Yeah, definitely. Um, And I love journaling, too. I think that, um, yeah, I find it difficult with people that aren't um, as invested in recovery to get them to journal. Um, So (laughs) so that can be a barrier. But if they're willing to, I think that's great. Um, And reflection is incredibly important. And yeah, the, the mind just makes a catastrophe out of everything. So, um, recognizing like, okay, well, last time I did this, I was really scared. And then I worried about nothing. Mm -hmm. I ate the piece of bread and nothing happened. I had anxiety afterwards, but in the long run, it was all okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, definitely journaling about that and like really writing out the experience and how it went, I think is crucial. Okay. Thank you so much. So I am going to end it here. Uh, We are going to continue and we're going to talk about hunger and fullness, but that will be posted in my following video after today. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, And I'll leave all Lauren's information in the links below. Um, But I will see you in my next video. And thank you so much, Lauren. Can't wait.